So now I'm going to talk about the ISLM model, which is one of the key models in intermediate macroeconomics. This is the fifth of six videos I plan to make for my intermediate macro class. I tend to do this in the traditional way. This is the way that goes, goes back to John Maynard Keynes and the Hicks Hansen synthesis. Uh, the traditional model, I don't really do much that, to match you know, modern policy. I, I, I kind of keep it in the, the way it was originally intended. Some textbooks do try to make the model match you know, Fed policy with the set interest rate try to incorporate the long run and, and do some other things, but I just teach the, the traditional model, which still has some useful insights. I've got to warn you, it's a static model, it's very intermediate level, advanced models go much, much further. Sometimes this model is criticized for not being advanced enough, but I think it gives some key insights both in how models are built for intermediate macro, but also for how policy works. You can actually come up with some useful conclusions from it. So to kind of get started, I'll lay out the idea of simultaneous equilibrium. Here we have two markets. One is the goods market, which is you know aggregate demand for uh, real goods and services, and then you've got the money market, um, which is supply and demand for money. Um, the goods market is a little bit more slower moving because you can you have to produce goods and consume them. Money market moves quickly, and so it's very hard to have a disequilibrium. But this model gives us equilibrium combinations of interest rate and output. Um, a number of combinations are possible, uh, but simultaneous equilibrium is where both markets have a single equilibrium point where the lines cross. Okay, so the way I look at it is I look at um, the IS curve, which is first it's a downward sloping curve of all possible combinations of R and Y. This stands for investment savings. Uh, one way to look at it is investment and savings must be equal. So the sources of funds, which are savings, are equal to the uses of funds or investment. If savings is too high, there's a glut of savings. It would push down the interest rate um, and discourage low savings. Um, at the same time, low interest rates would push up investment, so equilibrium would be reached. It's slow moving because the goods market responds slowly because goods have to be produced and stored and sold, but uh, you can look at it that way, and uh, um, I kind of mention it, but I don't draw it. I look at it as an income equals expenditures. You could also look at it as you know the supply of goods or production is uh, equal to demand for goods, and so supply and demand are equal in the economy. Income and expenditure, I, this is the model I draw. I use my aggregate expenditure or income expenditure model. Basically, if a country uh, must uh, buy everything that it earns, must spend all its money, if it spends too much, inventories will be drawn down, and that's out of equilibrium. But if it spends too little, you wind up with unemployment, right? A country produces, but nobody wants to buy its goods, and it winds up building inventories or going into recession or so forth. So I use the income expenditure model, but like I said, you could also look at it in terms of savings investment model. You can draw it from there, or you could look at it just thinking about it as aggregate demand equal you know supply in the economy. All right. So all we're going to derive different combinations of R and Y. We're essentially going to change R and be out of equilibrium. We can move Y to bring equilibrium back. So for every new R, there's going to be a new Y. Right? The way you can think about it is if interest rates go up from a given point, investment goes down. You could look at it as there's too little investment, too much savings, and so how do you save less to have, you know, not have too much savings? Well, income would go down. So you can restore equilibrium through Y going down. And this equation shows that if savings is what's left over, income minus government minus consumption, all else equal, if there's uh, too little investment, you can reduce savings to match and restore equilibrium by reducing output. So you could basically have a new combination with a higher R and a lower Y. Okay, And we can do that for different points and we can draw the curve. Uh, you could bring it in through the SI, savings investment model, that's a little bit, I drew it before, but essentially lower income, so starting with income, shifts S to the left and raises R. Okay, so again, it's a combination. From a given point, a higher R and a lower Y will bring back equilibrium, and I'll draw that using the aggregate expenditure model. Money markets, the LM curve, that stands for liquidity money. Again, goes back to Keynes. Money supply and money demand are equal. Now, I can draw that on that graph. Basically, you shift income up. More people compete for money. More people need money for more transactions due to higher income. And then that makes money more expensive. The interest rate will go up. Um, you can talk about the opportunity cost of holding money. Uh, money does not pay interest. Uh, but because people are choosing to hold money instead of bonds, higher interest rates would actually mean that people will hold less money and more bonds. Right? So that's how the interest rate ties to money. So we've got two graphs. We can get different combinations of R and Y. This is a positive upward sloping curve. This is negative. They go in opposite directions. Where they cross is equilibrium in both markets simultaneously. All right? So to start out with the goods market, 
This one, this is a model I tend to use. I talk about it in a different video. This is equilibrium condition where spending equals income. This is the spending curve, aggregate expenditures, consumption, investment, government spending, and net exports. You can assume that to be zero if you want. Um, but this is used for three different models. Okay, so in principles, I talk about aggregate demand. If you change P, raising P will give you less real spending and a new equilibrium. You, you can draw that on the AS, AD model as the AD curve. I, international finance, I draw the DD curve. If I weaken the currency, people spend more, and you get different combinations of the exchange rate and output. Here, we're going to change R. Changing the interest rate will change investment and will shift up or down spending or aggregate expenditure. And so changing R will give you different crossing points or different Ys. Okay, so raising the interest rate lowers aggregate expenditure because of investment, and that will lead to lower GDP in equilibrium. Lowering the interest rate does the opposite. It will raise investment, raise total spending, and raise total GDP. Right? So let's map out three points. Okay, I've got the low interest rate, the starting point in the middle, and then the higher interest rate. And by change, by lowering the interest rate from the starting point, will give us uh, higher spending. Right. So here is the the IS curve is going to be mapped on this graph, which has R on the vertical axis, the interest rate, and Y. So aggregate expenditure doesn't have prices, doesn't have interest rate, doesn't have exchange rate. You can shift it around and you can remap the points. So this is the starting point, R zero, Y zero, and we are going to lower interest rates. Doing that raises aggregate expenditure, and the new equilibrium spending is going to be Y1. So the lower interest rate and higher GDP are this green point here. If you go the opposite direction, you raise rates, you're going to find out that investment drops and the multiplier effect kicks in, so equilibrium GDP will be lower. And again, the lower investment uh, involves lower spending to match. And so this is the higher interest rate, lower GDP, equilibrium condition. Again, the crossing point means that there's no gap. There's not excess spending, where spending is higher than should be, or, or higher than what matches the equilibrium condition, and there's not too little spending, right? This is equilibrium where there's exactly as much spending as income, right? So these three points represent different combinations of the interest rate and output in the goods market. All of these are crossing points. All of these are equilibrium in the market. Now, this is what, given, according to, you know, Ceteris Paribus, all else equal, one set of conditions, one government spending, we're assuming it not to change. Same thing for taxes and some other things. But what if we change those? If you change government spending, taxes, or these other variables, you get the shift in the curve, right? The, I'll draw this for the money market, but the way to think about it is, what if government spending were higher? All of these points would start out at an even higher GDP somewhere over here. The crossing point would be somewhere over up here. And so we could redraw these three lines simply just starting at a higher GDP. So we could redraw the three points, all of them at a higher GDP because government spending is higher. That would give us a new line. Right? But right now we can connect the lines and we have this IS curve. We could do everything in between and get every single point to make a line, connect the dots. Right? But if we were to redraw it right, with a higher GDP, we would be over here. So you can say that higher government spending just is a higher or rightward shifting. Sometimes you could say upward, but I say a rightward shift in the IS curve. Government spending increases, as well as tax decreases, wealth decreases, exchange rate depreciations, I do it up for depreciation, etc. Simply say, all of that, all of these should have higher production now, lead to a rightward shift in the IS curve. All right, LM curve is a little bit easier. It's MS equals MD, money supply and money demand are equal. Uh, there's going to be no shortage of money in the market. The markets respond pretty quickly. It's not, you don't build up inventories of money like you do inventories of goods. All right, so. At this given starting point, the interest rate and output are here. This is a given output that is not drawn. All right, so for a given output, here's the interest rate. If you have a higher interest rate, money demand goes up. Right? More transactions demand for money. People want more money to buy more things with their higher income. Income goes up, interest rate goes up. And so this is the higher interest rate, higher output equilibrium combination for the money market. Okay, if you go the opposite direction, it'll be lower, lower GDP, lower income leads to lower interest rate in the market. You can connect the dots, you can get the LM curve with every point in between. All right, now if you were to do it, as I said before, you could shift the money supply out. Um, this is going to be the, sh the right word shift in the LM curve. Okay, so let's redraw the graph with. Uh, more money. Okay, so the biggest shift to the LM curve is a change in the money supply. All right, so if I move money supply out, there's more money supply. You could see the original interest rate is lower, so at R0, but the interest rates are all lower, right? Every 
every single one of these three points is at a lower interest rate than the starting point, okay? And look here, lower, lower, and if I kept going, lower. And so you can say that an increase in the money supply allows you to redraw the graph and get all your points at a rightward or downward shift in the LM curve, okay? So you can do the same thing for IS. It's a little harder to draw because it would be way up. Um, but here you can see that the shifting money supply shifts LM to the right. So for, for me at least, I talk about how increases in the money supply will shift LM to the right, or you could say LM down, okay? So that's one type of policy, that's monetary policy. And the other one obviously is fiscal policy. Um, and so one thing I want to say before I, I show you this is that you can shift one of the curves at a time, and you can also as you do it, you, you actually move along the curve that you're not shifting. And so if you increase the money supply, something does happen in the goods market, but you don't have to draw the IS curve shifting to do it. You simply go from a point here to a point here, or a point here, maybe you go up. You're moving along the curve because you are responding to the change in conditions in the other market. So for example, if I increase the money supply, it's going to lower the interest rate. Okay, and so that's kind of matching what you would know for policy. So the Fed's going to use open market operations. They're going to buy bonds. They're going to increase the money supply. Here's the end result. Lower interest rates, right? The Fed lowered rates, higher GDP. Okay, that's a monetary expansion that leads to a cut in rates and an increase in GDP, and that's kind of intended. In the goods market, the goods market responds to the lower rates by investing more. And so we drew three points on the AIS curve from R0 to R1, this is simply two of the points we drew. So the goods market does expand, but it's just two points that we drew. And so you don't have to move the curve to know that this represents two equilib equilibrium conditions. So in the sixth video, I'll show you all the graphs that go to derive this. You can actually see it responding. But right now, money, money expands, LM moves right, goods market also responds, right? The change in conditions shifts one curve, but the movement is just saying, hey, pick two points that you already drew. So, and then again, you can also see the end result of policy. So this is expansionary monetary policy. Uh, it leads to higher GDP because rate and rates are lower, right? What about the fiscal expansion? All right, so government spends more, and you would see that the end result is higher interest rates and higher GDP, and that's what could happen after the, you know, government expansion. Um, also, the tax cut of 2017 led to higher rates probably, as well as higher GDP. You wind up at this point. Again, the money market doesn't move, but as the government spends more, then there's going to be higher demand for money because of higher GDP, and it's going to respond here. And so you move along the curve that you didn't shift. Now, you could have two changes in conditions for both. So this is a simultaneous, if you keep them both, right here is a simultaneous fiscal and monetary expansion. Okay, so the up and the down in interest rates cancel out, but it's two increases in GDP, so it's clearly an increase in GDP, but the up and down could cancel out or one could dominate. You can't really say if it's a net effect of zero or if it's a little increase or a little decrease, so it's ambiguous, right? So sometimes you could have two policy changes at once, right? So you could shift both curves. Right? So that's kind of a, a brief introduction to the ISLM curve, right? We showed you that this represents, the IS curve represents savings and investment in equilibrium, or as I say, uh, income and spending in equilibrium. Equilibrium is restored after an in interest rate change by an output change. Again, you get all the possible points right, for different levels of R and Y. Um, LM is money supply equals money demand, and they're, they're all in the money market. These are all possible points, but the one point that simultaneous equilibrium in both is this crossing point. Okay, changing conditions in the goods market or the money market will uh, lead to changes in this equilibrium combination of R and Y, right? So it shows effects of fiscal and monetary policy uh, using this basic framework, but it can be used to uh, represent real events and predict real changes in these two variables.